Perfect. So, yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the next um, customer uh, focused session. Um, my name is Michael Holterland. I'm working for Dell. I'm a sales engineer. I'm working since uh, 10 years for Dell, but this is a joint session, so this is a customer-focused session. Here with me, it's uh, Felix Schüren. Felix? Hi, everyone. I'm Felix Schüren. I've been with my company for f more than 15 years now. I've been sysadmin, network engineer, and many other things <laughs> in technology, and I've recently made, been made uh, enterprise architect. So back to Michael. Thank you. So yeah, as I said, this is uh, the next uh, customer example, and uh, the customer uh, name is Host Europe, and this is again a networking uh, focus session. But before we start with uh, Felix um, input, um, a few words what Dell is doing in the OpenStack space. So what Dell is bringing to the table is a lot of experience. I think everybody is aware with the uh, OpenStack um, timetable uh, with the different uh, versions of OpenStack. And this is, well, the Dell OpenStack timeline. So what Dell is doing in the OpenStack space. Uh, Dell is one of the first A brands that supports the OpenStack project. So we are in the OpenStack project since uh, the Austin uh, release summit. Um, so we support OpenStack since the beginning as the only A brand. And what else we have done? Um, so Dell, for example, uh, provided one of the first uh, papers, bootstrapping of OpenStack clouds. This is what we have done 2011 with the BEXA release. Um, Dell developed also his own um, deployment tool. It was called, uh, called Crowbar. And while well, we open sourced Crowbar and we wrote also several papers to deploy OpenStack with um, Crowbar. What also Dell have done in the past, we brought um, OpenStack to uh, EMEA so that we support OpenStack also in EMEA. And this was announced, for example, on the World Hosting Day in Germany uh, in 2012. And uh, what else uh, Dell have done? Um, well, uh, we also built a paper together with SUSE as one of the major distributions of Linux and uh, we launched a um, SUSE-based OpenStack solution. And also one of the key components um, in the OpenStack space, software-defined storage based on Ceph. So we worked since the beginning with InkTank, since InkTank was founded, uh, Dell supports InkTank and Ceph. So we wrote several papers also in the Ceph space. So this is what we also bring on, ex um, on the table um, with a lot of experience in the Ceph space. And yeah, one of the last big players um, we work together is Red Hat. So there's also a um, joint reference architecture available with Red Hat. And what Dell also brings to the table um, during the time frame of OpenStack is, uh, well, we supported Ceph also with the second uh, Ceph day in EMEA. It was hosted in Frankfurt in the Dell office. So this is what Dell is doing in the uh, OpenStack space, so we support OpenStack since the beginning. A lot of experience in this uh, space. <coughs> so, reference architecture is important. It's important for our enterprise customers. So, our enterprise customers ask for um, a fully supported um, solution, software, infrastructure, and also services and tested um, solutions based on OpenStack with all major distributions. This is what Dell is doing in the OpenStack, um, in the OpenStack space as well. So we are uh, delivering as a single point of contact uh, a full supported um, OpenStack solution depending on the flavor of what you prefer. So for, for example, we work with uh, all major OpenStack distributions. So beginning with Canonical, uh, over SUSE, but also with Red Hat. So we give you the freedom of choice, um, which distribution you want to work with. Uh, we have also reference papers available. 
Yeah, one example is uh, one of the um, last partners from us in the OpenStack space is Red Hat. So we developed a complete go-to-market with Red Hat in the OpenStack space, beginning with the proof of concept. So pre-configured uh, solution, uh, this can grow to a pilot system uh, and then up to production. So this is fully tested and pre-configured from there. Yeah, one also important part is Ceph in the overall OpenStack solution, software-defined storage 2.0. So what is Ceph? Ceph is a software-defined storage solution, clear. It uh, provides a block and object storage. Uh, it could scale really massively into petabytes and it's open source based. So it fits very well to the OpenStack approach and Dell supports um, Ink Tank as uh, yeah, the company that supports and developed uh, Ceph since the beginning, um, since the Ink Tank was founded. So what we are doing in the Ceph space, uh, reference architecture, optimized configurations, but also I.O. guide, what you need really to size a Ceph solution. This is what Dell, um, how we support our customers uh, and the Ceph in this uh, case. And at last, the Dell Solution Center. So it's a great support really to test uh, OpenStack like in a productive way. So it's free of charge for all customers. It's a pre-sale support from Dell. And uh, we do briefings, design workshops, but also we give uh, customers the choice to test OpenStack and Ceph several weeks before they buy a solution or before they decide to go which way uh, inside the OpenStack um, approach. So that's what Dell is bringing to the table, but this is a customer session, so Felix, Here we go. So, uh, thank you, Michael, for this um, introduction. Um, I wanted to talk, I didn't want to talk about our company, really. We are a large hosting company uh, in Europe. We do a lot of hosting. Um, we have tens of thousands of virtual machines. I didn't get the exact figure, sadly, <laughs> but it's a lot. Um, Michael introduced me. so. Let's get to the meat, which is why you're here. Um, we did a bit of um, development on OpenStack uh, internally and trying to get it running. And one of the things that we came across was problems with neutron node failover. And I know that usually when people set these things up, they are so happy it works, they just have a single neutron node. <laughs> and we try to at least have some redundancy. And when we did failover tests, it didn't work directly. It worked after a while, so in general it was working. But the way we had set it up was for it to use gratuitous ARP. And after a, l a lot of debugging, it turned out that our internet router didn't support gratuitous ARP because it is a security risk because you are overwriting the ARP table with information from the outside. So the fix, in theory, was simple, but vendor-dependent. Um, we can only enable it on a physical interface, which means it doesn't only work. It, it, it'll, it'll, it, it'll then work for every connected VLAN on that thing where we might have different security policies. So this was really bad in our case, but it might save you a bit of time <laughs> if you come across something like this. Um, during setup of our environment, we also came across trouble with Ceph. And it's not so much with Ceph itself, but with the surrounding network of Ceph, where MTU issues um, were a problem. The fact that we were using more than one network was a problem. Um, and a, a lot of the yeah, IP addressing really was problematic because we, were, we weren't doing single flat layer two or single flat network. Um, because we were afraid of scaling issues. 
and that proved very, very troublesome. Um, regions and the concept of assigning fixed IP pools to regions for the floatings is a personal pet peeve of mine, something I don't like, and something that's really a bit, w a bit of waste, and it compounds the problem which I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> in essence, don't touch the network is what, you will what, what we usually found. People set up OpenStack, and OpenStack is complex. There's a lot of things that happen that need to work. And people are so happy that it finally works. Uh, they then they never looked at the network, or they sort of <laughs> broke the network many times in between. And at some point, it works. So don't touch the network, <laughs> never, <laughs> never again. Um, but the problem, of course, is networks are complex beasts, especially at scale. And if you don't touch the network, if you don't fix your underlying network, then it'll it's going to blow up at some point. It really will. Um, now this is, I suspect, a very common um, network design for an OpenStack installation that's coming out of the first round of DevOps. It, it really is a flat network, which I'm pretty certain most of you will have run at some point or are still running. Um, I even have two, n two neutron nodes in this, which isn't the norm. Um, and for this, let's say we have a Juniper EX4200 as the internet router. Um, I guess this is fa a fairly common type of model, which many of you might have looked at for medium-sized deployments. Because it's, um, it sports 16K ARP entries, it's a fairly well-sized box, and we are going to want to run 8,000 floating IPs off of this. So we're at 50% capacity in theory. And a quick reminder or a, a primer really on how most switches and routers these, uh, these days work. Um, you've got a CPU, which is really a, s a fairly standard spec PC talking to sp special hardware, which does the actual forwarding. Now this houses all the tables with routing tables, ARP tables, and all these things, and pushes information through this internal link towards the actual forwarding engines, which do the packet forwarding. And um, so we've got 8,000 floatings, or a bit more, it's a slash 19, um, about 75% usage at some point. And the, pro the, the trouble is, in my mind, really ARP. Now, with an, ARP, with an ARP timeout of an hour, we've got roughly two ARP requests per second just to maintain the 6,000 addresses in use. Some of them will auto-refresh while traffic is happening, but it's, it's not a lot. So where's the problem? The problem isn't with the used IPs. The problem is with the unused IPs. Because we have configured our router with a slash 19, as a directly attached network. So whenever traffic comes in for any IP out of that network, it needs to find out the MAC address. It needs to ARP. And that means every second, roughly, depends a bit on implementation, but roughly, as a rough guideline, every second you will send one packet, one broadcast packet, asking, hey, is anyone responsible for this IP address? <laughs> And that's per host. And if I'm having a port scan on my 8,000 floating range, that's pretty much every host. And I know that the large ranges of virtual uh, virtualization providers are interesting scan targets because a lot of things come up, and they might come up with default passwords or some <laughs> other it's <a> bad idea. <laughs> um, so going back to the EX4200, because I know it fairly well, um, that internal link ha actually has a hard forwarding limit of 1,000 packets per second. And at least two years ago, um, the vendor didn't put any class of service in. So you've got traffic hitting this thing, 
The CPU needs to generate ARP requests. And you've got 2,000 free IPs, so that's 2,000 ARPs per second going through that link, which also carries your statistics, your monitoring, your internal routing sessions, maybe your external routing sessions. And what happens, and it, this has happened at some point, um, is you start to get connection drops. You can start to lose connectivity in your IGP. Um, and this is an, an, a denial of service vector which most router vendors don't think of. These boxes are fairly well protected for traffic coming this way into the routing engine. But this is the device dosing itself because it is generating these packets. Um, and what, what I'm really annoyed with when it comes to ARP and the implementation chosen currently for most OpenStack installations is it's <laughs> why are we asking a question for which we know the answer? Because we know which neutron node is responsible for a specific floating IP. We've assigned it. <laughs> um, so why do we ask the network or the router to do broadcasting, which is essentially shouting into the room. We're interrupting everybody's attention to ask, hey, who's responsible for this? I actually know who's responsible. I was just too bored to tell the router, or t I didn't put it in to the router. So that is a point which I, th I attributed to the fact it only starts to show its ugly face at scale once you start to hit a couple thousand machines, uh, this starts to become a problem. If you hi hit five figures, it becomes a real problem. It's really problematic. And before OpenStack, a couple of years ago, um, we had, this, had a similar situation where we arped for traffic for virtual machines at 40,000 40, odd machines. And it was really killing our routers, really hurting them. And we converted them to a routed setup. Um, essentially, since w we know where we want traffic to go to, we know this floating needs to go to this neutron node, or if we think about DVR, to which compute node it needs to go. So we, s instead of having our internet router ask, we tell him. And the, r the, the way to tell routers how to reach IP next hops, I, the best way is BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. And Border Gateway Protocol is a technique used in the internet <laughs> since forever, and it scales a lot higher than ARP does. Um, and th if you do this, this relatively simple change, and I'm getting to how to get that information here, um, what you do is, on this machine, you, don't, you no longer configure the slash 19 as a directly attached interface. The router no longer ARPs. Only every, every floating that is assigned, this guy gets told, and he knows where to send it. So the only information th this needs to find out is the MAC address of the neutron node. But that's just per neutron node. It's not per floating IP. So it's several orders of magnitude that you save. And this is just an internal operation, and you can filter it. You can't force someone on the internet. So a port scan will not trigger any ARP happening on here. You can stop this happening. And the, the obvious solution might be to say, right, we've got the controller, or some sort of controller, some orchestration device. Why don't, where doesn't that talk to the internet router? But uh, one of the design ideas is the OpenStack installation should continue to run even if the controlling components are down. So we can't change the state, but it continues to work as it was. So this isn't the greatest idea. Um, and one of the ways to do this is root reflection. It's a standard technique in routing. Um, and this is sort of DVR in mind already. So each compute node, and this in this case it's a neutron component within it, the idea is it tells 
these special boxes, and the special boxes are really just BGP route reflectors. It's a network device, common network type of device, um, fairly easy to implement, standard vanilla setup. And what, it, what they do is they essentially tell, right, I'm responsible for this floating IP, and it, because it has this internal information anyway, it's rooted to the uh, internal bridges and the tap devices. And on export, it simply changes the information and says, actually, you can send that to me, send that to my address. And the only job of these devices is to collect and then con uh, uh, consolidate this information and send it to the actual internet router. And the nice side effect is, in many, many ins uh, uh, companies, the internet router is run by the networks team, while the OpenStack installation is run by a DevOps team or some other function, a sysadmin team. And the networks team, and I used to be in a network team for quite a while, usually are quite seclusive and quite, yeah, yeah, you just give me a ticket, it'll be done next week, <laughs> because running the, the, the core is uh, th th where stability is paramount because you're supporting everything. It, it just works very, very differently. So you could think of not using these and simply having each of the nodes talk directly to your internet router. But every time you add a compute node, then you need to do a config change on this device. And your network guys, network teams won't let you do that <laughs> in most instances. But the, the, the workaround is you set up these, you control these together with your compute nodes, with Puppet, with Chef, what, with whatever. And if you have a new compute node, you put them in here. And the nice thing, if you do this, is in a migration, what actually happens, rather than what typically happens with, with gratuitous ARP, and gratuitous ARP really is horrible because it's, it's just, you, you, you say something and pray it works. You have no idea if anybody actually listened to your change, to you telling you, hey, please use a new MAC address. You don't know, you just assume it's hopefully going to work out. And as I um, mentioned initially, it didn't work out for us because our router just simply ignored these messages. But what happens is I have this VM and it's going to migrate over here. And on migration, this sends a root, a root withdrawal and in BGP, each, each BGP speaker has an active TCP session to these devices. So it's, it's, a, it's a stateful protocol. It's, it's known how, it, how the current state is. And on migration, this sends a withdrawal. This sends, hey, I've got a new route. The information gets here. The routing table is updated and traffic gets sent to the new device. And you didn't need any broadcast. You didn't, so none of the others really know something happened even, uh, and they weren't bothered. You didn't shout in the room saying, hey, I'm responsible for this now. You simply told all the relevant parties and left the rest alone. Um, that brings me to really what we learned during setting up our OpenStack clusters and um, layer 2 domains are dangerous. They really, really are. Layer 2 is a binary, uh, almost a binary thing. It works and then it's broken at some point. And when it breaks, you're lost. You've got pretty much no idea why it broke. So for us, it really is always about scaling down layer 2 domains as small as possible. We use layer 2 when we must, but we don't want to. And that t ties into ARP. ARP, I see as a necessary evil. ARP is so horrible in so many ways. It's a security risk, it's a, it's a risk to the infrastructure, and it's really bothersome just shouting in the room and having thousands of devices doing, oh, oh no, no, it's not for me, okay. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so cutting down on ARP, if you want to scale, is really, really, a, a, it's a really good idea, I think. Um, GARP, don't do it. If you, if you can't get to a routing setup quickly, um, one important thing, instead of GARP, if you can, for redundancy, use virtual MAC addresses. If you use a virtual MAC address, or you 
s sort of take over the MAC address together with the IP on a failover. What happens is you don't need to update the ARP tables. The only thing you need to update by sending an appropriately crafted Ethernet frame is the switching devices to have a new switching path. And that's a standard feature of Ethernet switching. And usually works, usually works, whereas GARP sometimes works, not always. Um, one thing we also did, which was very, very helpful, is an out-of-band management network. So we've got our compute nodes and all the other storage nodes and everything with 10G, but have a 1G connection from the side. That is troublesome to a certain extent with the automated deployment and all the other things because it messes most of the systems up because it's not a flat network, it's not a single network, there's multiple of them. They have got multiple r ways to do th stuff. Um, but the actual magic there is really two IP rule entries on Linux boxes. It's not that hard. And it was a tremendous help because we could debug and not shoot ourselves in the foot and needing to go k the KVM route or something, some, some keyboard emulation thing. Um, routing, in my mind, solves everything. Now, I come from a, from a network engineering background and routing uh, sort of is in my blood. Um, but over the years, it's always been ARP and layer two. It's, it seems simple, but once it's broken, you're, you're lost. You can't do pretty much anything. And with routing, that's a, a lot better supported uh, from the route from the went from the vendors it's a lot simpler to debug because it's stateful to look up information and do all these wonderful things that we need to do in the operation of these things and the, the one thing we should always prepare for is what happens when it fails or when it doesn't work and routing and layer 3 really is the one thing that will help you there so yeah, that's sort of what I wanted to say. ARP is evil. <laughs> Don't do it if you can. Only use it when you must. And this opens the space for questions, if you have. Yes, please. How are you affected by IPv6? Yeah, the question is, how are you affected by IPv6? Um, IPv6 is only making it worse. <laughs> um, so IPv6 and neighbor discovery really the same thing as ARP. And the problem with IPv6 is the recommendation that you should use the slash 48 if you can, at least the slash 64 on the links. And that's just madness for your routers. Uh, um, and in, in fact, a, a lot of the core networks, the core transfer networks, don't put a slash 64 on their transfer links. They put a slash 127 if they can. <laughs> um, just to cut down on the problem of, of port scans triggering all these neighbor discovery entries. It just works like ARP. And in, in routing, uh, the beauty is it works identical. It doesn't, you don't need to change anything. You might, run to want to, uh, you might have to, to run multi-protocol BGP, which has been around for a long time, and sort of say, right, this is a v4 address, this is a v6 address. So the yeah, only downside uh, with using routing really is most routers aren't optimized for sh uh, host routes so you've got because you've got single IP prefixes that the router needs to forward which sometimes is a problem in the forwarding plane but ask your router vendor it, it, with, with modern kit it shouldn't be other questions yes please How would this problem change if your tenants were running overlay networks? Um, with overlay networks, you have an entry and an exit point into the overlay. And that's where you would run the routing component, where you would say, right, please send traffic for this public network, whether it's a single floating or a sort of longer uh, subnet prefix please send it to me. That's every, uh, essentially all you are telling the underlay network because the, the internet router really is our underlay and 
that's where the problem is. So a lot of what I talked about, or pretty much all of what I talked about, isn't so much inherent to OpenStack. It's the network infrastructure surrounding it, which is suffering because of some of th some of the design uh, the d the current design decisions. And in terms of an overlay, you've got all the usual overlay stuff you need to do. You need to set up your tunnels. You need to have the encapsulation and erase the MTU and all of that. And there are interesting ideas. Um, uh, Contrail, for instance on how to do this with routing as well. And I agree with many of these ideas, but in terms of this is about getting traffic to the correct entry point into an overlay, and whether it's an actual overlay or just a single compute node which does a one-to-one -one mapping, doesn't really matter, but that's a technique to use to get it to the overlay entry point. Yes, please. Okay, so the question is around uh, the separation between running your network traditionally and having a DevOps team running OpenStack and when network problems happen uh, within OpenStack, how to deal with debugging and, and who to go to, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely agreed. So um, it's a problem <laughs> um, in, in short. The and it means that you need network knowledge in your DevOps teams, in your OpenStack teams. You really need network engineering knowledge in there. Because if you're running overlays, the way I've seen it m in most places, you don't have um, you don't have your uh, you have your networks team and they don't have a clue about OpenStack. And your OpenStack team does all the tunneling and all the encapsulation and runs the overlay which means your network ops team, your, cl your classic network ops team, only sees compute to compute traffic or compute to neutron traffic, can't help you with what's inside. And the, the whole overlay thing is fairly complex and you really need network engineering knowledge in the DevOps team that runs OpenStack. That's the only solution. So it, it, in my mind, it'll be the, the current network team uh, sort of evolves into a role similar to that of the internet carriers, saying, right, I'm, I, I'm packet pushing, just give me your packets, I'll deliver them. Whatever you do in there is your responsibility. My job is to, s to, s to hand frames or pass frames correctly and send IP packets correctly. So you really, I think, need the, the engineering, the network engineering expertise within the OpenStack team. Oh, I think there, there was a question there. Um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> I did have one. Uh, it sort of de deteriorated because the hardware was too old over the last weeks. Um, I'll be happy to talk a bit more. I have some more slides uh, which I couldn't f fit in here. So just hit me up. I'm, I'm here at least till Wednesday and I'll be happy to share some more thoughts. Um, the question is around the physical network hardware and how to integrate that and orchestrate that. And the answer is we didn't. Um, we set up the physical infrastructure sort of statically and rely on the overlay technologies. Um, sort of because of the because we have most of this traditional separation and the network team. So we said, right, let's use the network team as packet forwarding engine <laughs> in a way, and have them set up in their their old ways. Um, and then use overlays and do the, ne the, the network ourselves, in a way. There was a question, yeah.
Yeah. So the question is, did we consider using an SDN controller to solve our ARP issues? And yes, we did look at some SDN controllers, um, but most of them, in my book, were trying to do too many things and too, uh, too were in a way too, prescript too prescriptive. And uh, to me, it's about the, m the keeping the modularity and the, the openness, really. And um, so we did consider them, but didn't find them to be applicable to us. Exactly, and the other issue we had is most of the the management sides to most of the contr the SDN controllers we saw wouldn't uh, w would fall over at a certain scaling point anyway, and so we didn't feel they were scalable enough, and they were too prescriptive for us. Yeah. So that's why we didn't pick them. Uh, yeah. Um, at the moment, we're using um, Jiri. Uh, uh, so fairly vanilla, uh, with some optimizations I can't talk about yet. <laughs> but it, it, we started with a vanilla GRE setup. Uh, I think that. Come again. Uh, we used such a big subnet mask, the slash 19 I was talking about. Um, we typically, in, rea in, in uh, realistically use several slash 21s rather than a big slash 19, but it doesn't actually matter to the router because it's the same router and the same amount of ARP traffic. Yes, we, we do have multiple routers, but the traditional setup we have is a set of large data center routers per site. And so we kind of didn't want the management overhead of having multiple network routers in place. And there are ways to sort of scale around it in a bit but it doesn't solve the actual problem. And I think it's not that difficult to solve the actual underlying problem and the brokenness with ARP in a different fashion. How large is the production environment? Uh, the current production environment of OpenStack, I would have to uh, ask my colleagues. <laughs> um, the OpenStack setup isn't that large. We have only recently started deploying it. The routing solution we have in place, uh, have had in place for years, seven years or so, I think, and it carries 60 to 80,000 routes just for virtual machines. And that works. So I don't see any, any more questions raised. So um, I, ac I typically, no, I actually lied. I didn't bring cake, but I, Sure hope that our hosts have some. <laughs> uh, you might have luck there. So thank you for attending um, and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you.